Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's presentation of New Perspectives on Yiddish from a Century Old Archive. I'm Rebecca Roberts. I'm the curator of programming at Planet Word. Uh, if you found out about this program because you're already a member of Planet Word and you follow us on social media and you subscribe to our newsletter and all those good things, thank you for that support. It's really important to the museum. I know I say that every program, but it has the virtue of truth. It is one of the reasons we're able to keep admission free to the program and uh, bring you programs like this one. If you found out about this program from some other avenue through Evo or something else, um, we'd love to have you in the Planet Word orbit. The best way to do that is to subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do at planetwordmuseum.org. And I apologize for the dog noise in the background. That's just going to keep happening. I first learned about this project when I read an article in the New York Times in January. Um, I had never heard of the Evo Institute, even though it was founded way back in 1925 in what was then Vilna, Poland, is now Vilnius, Lithuania, so that part of the world moves around in terms of national borders. Um, and it's astounding to me that, you know, they were collecting this material in the 20s and 30s, which of course meant that during World War II, it was scattered and lost and hidden. Um, but it's that pre-World War II collection that has now been digitized and is available. Um, and so it's not just a perspective on a language that has often been dismissed, uh, but it's an era of that language that not as much is known about. So I am absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Stephanie Halpern. She's the director of the Evo Archives, and she's going to tell us all about that collection. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Rebecca, very much for having me. And thank you all for, for joining uh, me tonight. And we'll get started. So to, in tonight's program, uh, I'll share a little bit with you about the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research, the history of our collections, which uh, Rebecca has alluded to, um, our efforts to preserve these materials and to make them accessible to the world. And of course, I will share with you these archival materials and some surprising insights about Yiddish that we can glean from these newly digitized collections, which are online, available worldwide, free of charge. Um, but before we get to the digital realm, I just wanna draw your attention to this photograph here um, on this slide. This is uh, just one of several stack areas that we have uh, in the YIVO archives. Um, you know, I know we are doing this remotely, but uh, this is where all of our, our documents live. Um, and so if ever you are in New York, I encourage you to, to visit Evo and uh, to get a glimpse of these collections yourself. Those stacks hold uh, over 24 million records, including everything from manuscripts to photographs to sound recordings to objects on all aspects of Jewish life. Um, everything from Yiddish language, literature, and culture to European history with a specific focus on Eastern Europe to, of course, immigration, especially to the Americas. And we have uh, one of the largest collections of primary source materials on, on, on the Holocaust and its aftermath. Evo, though, had very modest beginnings. It took 100 years for us to, uh, to gather those 24 million documents. Um, as, as Rebecca said, Evo was founded in Vilna, Poland in 1925 by a group of Jewish scholars, writers, lay leaders who recognized the importance of, of, of collecting and researching and studying this 1,000 year history of Eastern European Jewry. And one of YIVO's foundational tenets was collecting the stuff of everyday Jewish life directly from the community. And YIVO did this in, in a variety of ways, um, including making calls for particular types of documents, putting out um, surveys and questionnaires. And, and YIVO became a, a really a global organization with societies around the world, collecting branches around the world um, that helped support YIVO, not just by collecting, but um, also uh, fundraising. And how, how could you collect uh, materials from around the world um, without the help uh, of, of individuals who lived in these places? Um, and so YIVO used a network of amateur collectors um, called Zamlers in Yiddish to gather materials, um, and to send them uh, to YIVO in Vilna. And by 1929, just four years after YIVO was founded, 
um, there were approximately 160 or so collecting circles that had hundreds of Zomlers that were part of them. Um, and in 1929, they had collected more than 50,000 pieces of folklore, folk tales, proverbs, uh, folk songs, and, and they sent them to Ivo. And Ivo, you know, then used these materials to create scholarship that not only illuminated and elevated the place of the Yiddish language and Yiddish culture for the wider world, but that also really showed uh, the Yiddish speaking community that there was great value in their own culture. The work of the Zomlers aided in the collecting and the research of, of YIVO's four main uh, sections, each of which were really meant to uh, focus on a different aspect of, uh, of Yiddish-speaking Jewry. There was the philological section, um, which, which focused on Yiddish language, literature, um, and folklore. Uh, and as you can see here, there's a, a great piece from our collection, um, a linguistic survey on, on the definite article that the philological section put out, um, among many other uh, surveys and questionnaires. Uh, there was the economic statistical section, which investigated contemporary Jewish demographic and economic trends. We have here um, a statistical survey of Jews in Vilna. Um, this specific survey shows uh, various professions. Uh, there was the, the historical section, um, whose focus really was on the history of the Jews in Eastern Europe from the 16th to the 19th centuries, with, with an emphasis really on uh, the very recent past um, and on the experiences of, of large numbers of ordinary Jews. And then finally, there was the uh, psychological pedagogical section, um, which really worked very closely with the Yiddish school system in Poland, emphasizing projects that related directly to contemporary pedagogy, um, gathering data on, on Jewish children and youth. You can see here um, a, 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 a grammar school test that was um, collected from the Yiddish school organization. Um, and they also uh, helped to provide standard Yiddish terminology and spelling rules for, for the classroom. Ivo collected materials and disseminated scholarship uninterrupted until 1939 with the outbreak of World War II. And in June 1940, a special Nazi task force, Einsatzstab Rosenberg, was created to, to plunder various Jewish cultural institutions across Europe. Um, Givo's holdings were, were among these mil the millions of, of documents that were, that were looted and destroyed. Um, and Givo's building stood just outside the bounds of the Vilna ghetto. And it was used um, as a holding ground for, for looted materials. Um, and forced laborers at that time were, were tasked with sorting materials, um, deciding which of these valuable cultural treasures uh, would be destroyed. Um, and which would be sent to, to Frankfurt uh, to the, the Institute uh, for the Study of the Jewish Question. Um, and a very heroic group of individuals dubbed the, the Paper Brigade um, risked their lives to, to save the materials. So they, they did this in a few ways. Um, they smuggled some materials in their clothes, in their shoes, out of the Yivo building um, and into the Vilna ghetto. And they hid these materials in, in bunkers um, around the ghetto in, in the hopes that uh, someone from the paper brigade would survive the war and, and, and dig up these materials. Um, and they also stuffed additional materials in the shipping crates bound for Frankfurt, um, again, uh, with the hope that um, what, that these that these materials they would survive. They may not, uh, but but these materials would. After the war, um, two members of the paper brigade, Avram Sutskever and Shmurka Katriginsky, two Yiddish poets uh, very closely affiliated with YIVO, did survive the war. Um, they went back uh, just about two weeks after um, the liberation of uh, Vilna by the Soviets, um, and they actually went into the Vilna ghetto and, and dug up um, dug up the materials that they had hidden in, in these bunkers. And these materials uh, were, were sent to New York. Now, the YIVO story, as um, many 
stories of institutions before the war is a bit complicated. Um, in 1939, uh, Yivo's um, uh, one of Yivo's founders and, and director, Max Weinreich, um, happened to be out at a linguistics conference. He was a linguist. Um, and he was told uh, by his colleagues, don't come back to Poland, go to New York. There had always been um, a branch in New York. Uh, uh, they, they did some collecting. They did a, a lot of fundraising. And Max Weinreich went to New York um, and, and officially moved the headquarters of YIVO from Vilna uh, to, to New York in 1940. Um, and so uh, when Avram Suskever and Shmarka Katrick Ginsky dug up these materials, there was a place for them to go. Um, and then at the Offenbach Archival Depot, the uh, United States Army, the Monuments, Fine Arts and Archives Division of, of the United States Army, some of you may better uh, know them as the Monuments Men, um, located um, a, a vast trove of materials um, belonging to YIVO. And in 1947, these materials were repatriated to YIVO in New York um, and, uh, and, and sent to YIVO's headquarters there. Um, a nice little story, uh, at that time, YIVO did not have, um, did not have the space to deal with what we would later come to find uh, amounted to over a million pages of documents and tens of thousands of volumes of books. Um, we had a relationship with the Manischewitz brothers um, who had a warehouse in, in New Jersey and they allowed YIVO to, to leave all of these crates um, in their warehouse until they could be sorted. And for decades, YIVO thought that those materials that had been repatriated, those materials that had been brought over, uh, that were dug up from the Vilna Ghetto were all of YIVO's materials that survived. Um, but it was discovered after the fall of the Soviet Union um, in the late 80s that there were hundreds of thousands of additional pages of YIVO materials still in Lithuania. And additional discoveries were made um, in, in 2016 and 2017 in, in other repositories. Now, YIVO made some attempts to, um, to, to, to retrieve those physical materials. Uh, they were never able to do so. And so it was decided um, that questions of ownership uh, needed to be put aside and we needed to um, create some type of large-scale digitization project so that these materials, YIVO materials, could be reunited for the first time uh, in, in over 70 years. Um, and that is when the Edward Blank YIVO Vilna Online Collections Project was born. Uh, we, as Rebecca said, we just completed this seven year, $7 million project to digitize over, uh, you know, almost a million and a half pages of documents and 12,000 volumes of books and put them all online. Um, and uh, we worked very closely with our four, with our three Lithuanian uh, partner institutions where YIVO materials um, are, are to this day. So before we get into these archival materials, a very brief introduction to the Yiddish language just to, just to orient us in this world. So the Yiddish language is a thousand years old. Um, it was the, the spoken language of everyday, of the everyday life of Ashkenazi Jewry, those, those Jews who hailed from Central and Eastern Europe. Um, Yiddish is written uh, with Hebrew characters, but it, it is not Hebrew at all. Um, in, in contrast to this everyday, to Yiddish, the everyday language, um, Hebrew was the, the language of religious texts. The first uh, record of um, a printed Yiddish sentence uh, is a blessing found in, in the Worms Machser uh, from 1272. And beginning in the, the 14th century, Yiddish was really commonly used for, um, for epic poems, uh, for these sort of European knightly romances, um, such as the Shmuel Buch, which, which reworks uh, the biblical story of, of the prophet Samuel into this more European setting. The history of, of Yiddish itself uh, parallels the history of, of Ashkenazic Jewry. Um, it's, it's not entirely known how Yiddish came to be a thousand years ago. Uh, there are several theories, but the most widely accepted is that of Max Weinreich. Uh, like I said, he was a linguistic, a, a linguist, um, a, a founder of YIVO, a director of YIVO. Um, and according to this theory, the language originated when Jews of, of Romance-speaking territories um, in what is now uh, southern 
southern France and, and northern Italy migrated to the Middle Rhine Basin. And uh, when they got to the Middle Rhine Basin, they shifted from this Jewish form of Romance language to uh, the local German of the period. And, and they adapted uh, this German to their needs. It, it, it became permeated with um, the rabbinical Hebrew and, and Aramaic that had formed a component of their previous language, as well as these Romance elements. And, and then beginning in the 11th century, the Crusades forced many uh, of, of these Jews to emigrate from the Rhine Basin. And with them, of course, a Yiddish moves eastward um, to Southern and Central Germany. And from there to what is now Bavaria, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Hungary. And, and, and then with this numerous features uh, from the Bavarian and Franconian dialects of German are added to, to this Yiddish language. Yiddish speaking Jews then settle in growing numbers um, in, in what is now Poland, Lithuania, Belarus, U Ukraine, Romania. And then over the course of time, Eastern Europe becomes uh, the center of Yiddish, uh, as well as the most populous Jewish settlement in the world. And this migration then further fuses Slavic elements into the Yiddish language. And so as a result of this, Yiddish is uh, is, is, is a result of, of linguistic fusion, um, a combination of all of these different sources. And because European Jews were always in contact with, with others, um, Yiddish was, was consistently being infused with new elements from different languages. Um, you know, the nature of Jewish involvement in trade and commerce and all of this cross-border travel um, frequently resulted in contact with speakers of other languages. Um, and then these, these borrowings would then serve to, to further enrich the Yiddish language. So just a, a good example of um, how all of these mixings and borrowings can be seen in various ways um, is, is, is how you say God in Yiddish. Um, so there is there are, there are several ways to say God, um, one being the sort of uh, more universal deity, Gott in Yiddish, um, there is the, the more personal deity interested in human fate, and this, would, this particular word would come from the dramatic element, their abishter. Um, there's the God that you call out to in the second person uh, from the Hebrew, Reboino Shaloilam. Um, and there's this more sort of philosophical God from, from the Ara Aramaic, Reboino Um, And then there's the sort of emotional kind of homespun God that is evoked um, invoked by these Slavic-derived endings, gotenu. Um, and, you know, in, as, as there are in, in many languages, um, there were several different um, Yiddish dialects. Uh, there's Northeastern Yiddish, which is the dialect of the North, um, very popularly called um, Lithuanian Yiddish or Litvish Yiddish, maybe you've heard that term. Um, its speakers are called Litvaks. And its territory encompasses what uh, today would be Lithuania, Belarus, uh, Latvia, portions of northeastern Poland, um, northern and, and, and eastern Ukraine, and, and also western Russia. And then there were the southern dialects. Um, and these would have been the largest um, dialects spoken, comprising about three quarters of all Yiddish speakers. Um, and, and this itself was divided into sort of further Polish and Ukrainian Yiddish. And so just to give an example of, um, of, of what these dialects would sound like with, with some more well-known phrases in, in, in um, Lithuanian Yiddish, you would say, Shana Madel, uh, um, uh, pretty girl, beautiful girl. Um, and in Polish, you would say, Shana Model. Um, uh, another example, maybe some of you uh, are more familiar with, um, or maybe you've eaten, um, in Lithuanian Yiddish, you would say kugel, um, and in Polish Yiddish, you would say kegel. It's estimated that around 11 million people um, spoke Yiddish before the Holocaust, and at its peak, um, it was spoken by about 90% of the world's Jewry. Today, most of the people who, who speak Yiddish are Hasidim and other Haredim, the other orth, ultra, ultra Orthodox uh, sects. And estimates really vary pretty widely um, about how many speakers there are today, but it's somewhere in the range of 350,000 to 1.1 million. 
And if you want to know um, more about the Yiddish language, this was Yiddish language while standing on one foot. Um, there's a great uh, article in the Yivo Encyclopedia. Um, and if you really want to learn even more and, and, and become an expert, you can read Max Weinreich's History of the Yiddish Language. Okay, on to the, on to the archives, onto the documents. Um, like I said, uh, one of Yivo's um, missions was, was sending um, Zomlers out with questionnaires um, and, and, and uh, many of the questionnaires um, were meant to collect folklore of all types. Um, storytelling in Yiddish was a very pervasive feature of the everyday life of, of, East, um, of Eastern European Jews. And the Zomlers were encouraged to really engage those who moved around, you know, itinerant um, artisans, merchants, matchmakers, preachers, wandering students. Um, these were all people who were sought out by Zomlers uh, to be storytellers because they would have amassed a really large repertoire of stories um, that would have been heard um, uh, um, from, you know, the, their co-territorial uh, neighbors. And you know, remember that these, these folk tales, they come from an or, oral storytelling tradition. And the very act of writing these stories down on paper uh, as the Zomlers collected them, that act alone really changed them. And Yivo was conscious of this. Um, and they distributed sets of rules and tips for Zomlers, uh, as you can see here, uh, Yivo's rules for collecting ethnographic materials, which was put out in 1925. Um, and, and these rules really urged Zomlers to listen attentively to the stories that uh, were being told by people and, and the stories people were telling each other and to not try to make the stories any prettier while writing them down. Um, Yivo urged them to, to sort of set the, the stories down exactly as the teller told them, um, including all asides, all aphorisms, um, because Yivo really wanted to try and capture this oral tradition. Um, of course, this was extremely difficult. And one Zomler um, remarked that the written form of the storyteller's art um, was just a very weak echo of, of what was heard from the storyteller's mouth. You know, the poses, the gestures, um, the sound of the voice, uh, this artistic manner, none of those could really be captured on paper. And Yivo was interested in collecting really as many variants of a story as possible um, because they weren't just interested in the contents, the themes. Um, they were interested in the way the story was told um, and all of the linguistic choices and it, uh, that, were, that were made, the differences between tellings between people, even between individuals of uh, the same family. I um, mean, if you can imagine it, by 1938, uh, Yivo's folklore collection contained over 100,000 items. One of the, the interesting things that we clearly see from, from Yivo's collections is that Yiddish storytelling fell into several main categories. There was the Moshel, uh, the, the parable, um, the Wundermeisa, the, the wonder tale, the Witzigmeisele, or the fool's tale. Maybe some of you have heard or are familiar with the wise men of Chelm tales. Um, that would be a, a fool's tale. The Masoya or the legend, um, the Kindermaisa, the, 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 the children, the child's tale. Um, and there were a whole category, there's a whole category of students called the Nias uh, or the news stories from the outside world where um, individuals would, uh, would, you know, in these small towns in these shtetlach would, would, um, would hear a piece of news and, and, and spread it around orally. So really one of the, 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 the favorites was, uh, was a story with a, with a moral, the, the mushal, the parable, um, right? A tale that employs um, examples, analogies to really make its point. And in these stories, the deeds of ancient heroes or ordinary people and even animals serve to illustrate some kind of moral point. Um, so I'm gonna tell you a, uh, uh, um, a nice example of a mushal. Um, you can see this here on the screen. Um, things can always get worse. So here's the story. Once there was a poor man who thought it was too bad that he had to go about begging for bread and he complained about it to God. With that, a hump grew on his back. And in addition to the hump, a man grew there too. And the man had a mouth as well. 
And each time the beggar tried to eat a morsel of bread, the man on his back snatched it from him. Then the beggar prayed, neither erase, O Lord, nor write. Let things be the way they were. And this is why one must never say that things are bad. They can always get worse. So the a, another favorite um, uh, type of story uh, are, are the legends that the Memorats. Uh, I find these particularly interesting because the tellers always presented them um, as an account of, uh, of an extraordinary event that was purported to actually have occurred in a very specific time at a very specific place. Um, oftentimes it would be, you know, explaining how a synagogue came to be built in a certain location or something like, uh, you know, how a holy place, how a synagogue was, was, was miraculously saved by a fire. There's a great story where a teller recounts a fire that happened um, uh, near the synagogue in, in, in his town um, and a flock of doves comes and they fly around the synagogue and they're able to hold the, the fire at bay with wing, with wind from their flapping wings. Um, and the Yiddish Memorat, um, uh, you, you may gather, was often full of these supernatural elements, um, especially supernatural creatures that within the Yiddish folk tradition were believed to to be real entities. Um, so a lot of, um, of these stories tell of the transmigration of a soul, a Gilgal, um, where the soul of of a human or of an animal attaches itself to, to some kind of host. Um, perhaps uh, sort of the, the better known supernatural entity um, today uh, that, that comes from Yiddish folk tales is the Dybbuk, um, the restless spirit of, of a dead person. Um, and you may be familiar with um, Shin Ansky's very famous Yiddish play, um, The Dybbuk, um, uh, which is written and sort of draws directly from um, these source materials, these folklore materials that were collected um, uh, by various ethnographic uh, commissions. So a very short memorat about an elf um, from our collection, uh, collected in, in Poland um, in 1926 from um, Reb Shia Heschel, a bookbinder. So Reb Shia Heschel tells this story. My grandmother used to tell all sorts of tales but I have to say that she never told any lies. Once she told us that one day when she was lying in bed, she saw an elf crawl out from under it. Her baby was also lying in the bed and crying. The elf went up to it and rocked it for a while, then gave the baby a light slap, which made it stop crying. After that, the elf trotted up to a cupboard where a flask of brandy was stored. It took out the brandy, had a few nips and ran back under the bed. Well, from that time on, my grandmother never had to buy brandy because no matter how much you poured out of the flask the elf had sipped from, it always remained full. We could all use a, an elf like that sometimes. Evo also collected a, a very large number of materials, um, including stories and games and riddles that give insight um, into the language and the life of children and youth. Um, and, for instance, um, there's a there's a, a large collection of nonsense tales of Ligen Meislech, these little fibbing tales, um, tales that are known as Nishkestoyben, Nishkefloygen, far fetched, literally um, tales that neither ascend nor fly. Um, and the humor of these tales lies in this kind of continuous flow of contradictions, of non sequiturs, strange juxtapositions of people and events. Um, and they were especially popular during, during Purim, um, uh, which is the, the holiday that celebrates the defeat of Haman um, in his plans to destroy the, the Jews of Persia during the reign of King Ahasuerus. Um, and this very carnivalesque mood pervades the holiday, right? You're meant to make noise uh, with groggers, with noisemakers to blot out the name of, of Haman. Um, and so non your nonsense tales um, sort of become part of, of this reverie. Um, and so here's a nice little nonsense tale just to kind of get the idea of how words and terms of phrases and imagery all flow into one another. Um, you see it here, it's called a pain in the neck collected um, in, in 1928. Once upon a time, there was a very rich, poor man. He had no children except for nine daughters. His oldest son took it into his head to go to the fair. So he saddled a match, rode up the chimney and was driven riding to the water. Two sieves, one with a bottom, the other without, were floating in the water. 
he sat down between them and floated. Suddenly, he heard someone shout that the synagogue was on fire, so he ran to rescue the bathhouse. But just then, he remembered that he hadn't eaten yet, so he went to buy something to eat. Someone said, you're going to eat? Today is such an important fast day. The Russians are beating each other. He went on and was told, you're going to eat today on such a holiday? Your wife has given birth to a boy. He remembered that he didn't have any diapers, so he rode to the forest for twigs, but his hands got stuck. So he ran to fetch an ax, and as he went, he saw a fly at the tip of the church steeple, and she did not look well. So he went to the doctor for medicine. Then he ran into the city to get a pain in the neck because he was a pain in the neck. Children were, were also very fond of more complex word games like riddles and jokes um, and even, even secret made up languages. So this, this um, document in the middle here um, is very interesting. Um, it's on the secret language of children, uh, sort of a Yiddish pig Latin. Um, and this report was sent by, in, by one of the Zomlers to Yivo in 1938. And it explains uh, this secret language for girls where consonant clusters uh, would be moved around and a suffix and a prefix would be added. Um, and he, he gives an example here um, that I was able to pull out. Or hot mir lieb, he loves me, uh, would in this secret language for girls become seretia, or hotia, or mitia, or litia. It's a mouthful. Um, and this Samler actually also talks about a secret language for, um, for boys that he himself used growing up. Um, it was a language based on gematria or on um, this system of equating uh, the, the, the Hebrew alphabet with numbers. So we have um, uh, many words in our collection uh, that, that the Zomlers sent to Yivo that document um, different types of slang that was specific to a particular trade or a particular profession. Um, and, and you know many of these words were a type of private language that served um, as an expression of, of group solidarity and also as a means of concealment um, from outsiders. So you might be surprised to find out, or maybe not, um, that we have in our collections many examples of Gnovin Loshin or um, the language of thieves. So Gnovin Loshin uh, includes euphemisms for lots of different tools of the trade. Um, I'll just give you a few examples. Uh, the word feather um, literally means feather, but it would have been used by thieves to mean knife. Uh, the word spire uh, literally means spitter, um, but that is what they called uh, a revolver. Um, menta, mint, uh, would be a policeman. Um, and, and the helfer, uh, which literally means helper, uh, was a police spy. This is a, a, a great, I'll just pause a moment um, on, this, on this photograph. Um, it's a, uh, an image of a, of a, of a young uh, you know, Jewish boy from 1906 um, who was branded uh, with the word thief in three languages because he was caught stealing from, uh, from a, a Polish doctor. Um, and the story along with this picture is that um, Jewish leaders protested this um, and they were expelled from the city for two years um, because of their protest. There is um, uh, wagon drivers were, were a big, big trade, um, a big profession for Jews. Um, and uh, the wagon driver, the Balagola, the, the Balagola Lushan, the, the, the language of the wagon drivers is very colorful, um, especially when it comes to um, terms for horses, uh, naturally. And so um, you have uh, a horse that could be called an oddler, an eagle, literally, uh, a horse that, that flies very quickly. Um, an ironman, uh, literally a testicle man, uh, which is what they would have called a stallion. Um, and a mare could be called uh, schwester, sister, mama, mother, um, or balabusta, lady of the house. Um, and a particular uh, favorite phrase of mine from the Balagola Lushan um, is the phrase a lulav mit an esrig. Um, and so this refers to a, a lulav and an etrog, uh, esrig are, are two ritual objects that are used on the holiday of Sukkot, um, a harvest festival. Um, and uh, there's the, the tall lulav with um, uh, 
made of three types of branches, the palm, the willow, and the myrtle, and the, and the etrog, it's a citron, you know, sort of looks like a, a lemon, a little bit of a bigger lemon. Um, and you would hold them together, you hold them together and you shake them. And so you have this tall uh, lulav, this um, uh, small etrog. And so a lulav uh, mid an esrig would be when a small horse and a large horse were harnessed together. Um, and this is a great photograph uh, of a Jewish coach driver um, from Warsaw taken in, in about 1924. Um, and and the, uh, the caption on the back says that this coach driver was the oldest in Warsaw. Um, and he's 82 years old, still, uh, still acting as a, still a wagon driver. And the, the caption always says he still um, enjoys a good schnapps every day. I'll just give you one more example of, of this trade slang. Um, you know, actors uh, were very popular. Yiddish theater was extremely popular in, in, in Eastern Europe and in America. And so lots of slang terms developed around, around acting, around the theater. Um, so the term schmear, literally a scribbler, um, would be a, a, the term for a very bad playwright. Uh, patriot, uh, literally a patriot, um, is what uh, um, you would call someone who was fiercely devoted to a particular actor. And there were many patriots and they would oftentimes, there are accounts of them getting into fights on the street about, about who the, the better actor is. Um, there are a number of, of phrases that uh, use the word bulba, the potato. Um, um, so machen a bulba, uh, to make a blunder. Um, it would be used for an actor who, um, who misses his lines. Um, Redden von Arbo, literally to talk from the sleeve, would be to, to improvise lines. Um, and then an Americanism um, in, in, in actor slang, uh, traveling off their vibes or traveling off their man's ticket. Um, to, to travel on um, a husband or a wife's, on, on one spouse's ticket, meaning to be hired um, because the theater only really wanted uh, the husband or the wife to come perform. So in addition to all of the slang, um, Yivo collected materials that aimed to serve a, a much more prescriptive function um, uh, by determining you know, standard vocabulary and, and collecting everything, um, including lists of words relating to things like bookbinding and locksmithing, ironing, zoology, tin works, liquor distilling, woodwork, honey making, mead making, hat making, knitting, the list goes on and on and on. Um, and in this way, uh, in, in collecting like this, Yivo really aided the work of communal and educational organizations that functioned in Yiddish and needed a, a range of up-to-date and specialized terminology. So for example, um, there was a need for specialized textbooks for ORT, for the Society for the Promotion of Handicraft and Agricultural Work Among the Jews. Um, and this was an organization that encouraged Jews to um, to learn a trade and, and, and try to improve their economic status through this trade. And so the Jewish Vocational School of Ort provided Jewish youth who had completed elementary school an opportunity to acquire um, vocational training. And uh, they, they provided theoretical and practical education in the field of, of mechanics and technology. Um, and of course, they, um, they needed materials to do so. And so um, you see here an ORT manual on measuring electrical resistance, um, you know, various uh, diagrams of plumbing and sewage plants, um, and, and, and you see some of this terminology um, uh, uh, that Yivo collected. It's a very sort of well-worn stereotype that um, that Jews have no connection to the natural world. And, and this is based on the image of the Jew as this physically weak urban dweller who is interested um, only in, in, in intellectual or in capitalist pursuit. And this belief extends um, or extended to ideas regarding the deficiency of the Yiddish language. 
right, the idea that Yiddish lacked um, this linguistic fullness to really appropriately describe various concepts and terms um, such as those that were used for the botanical world. But I am here to tell you that uh, Yiddish is, is very rich with terms describing the world of plants. Um, the use of botanical terms uh, in written Yiddish can be dated as far back as 1290, uh, where Yiddish words for things like poppy, mun, mint, uh, miyatka, or menta, um, uh, find find usage in these in these written texts, and there were books um, on folk medicine from the 15th and the 16th century that also listed um, terms for plants, including things like ginger, imber, uh, garlic, noble. Yiddish children's games um, uh, and and rhymes were a great source uh, for for botanical language, and so uh, a really one that I love, um, the maple tree, uh, nezboim in Yiddish, literally the nose tree. Um, this, this Yiddish rendering um, is really a perfect illustration of how the seed pods of the tree could be split open and, and stuck to the end of your nose. Um, and you, you can call uh, peanuts, uh, Rebbe Nislech, Rabbi Nuts, um, or Moshe Rabbeinu Nislech, uh, Moses nuts, um, and they supposedly get their name uh, from the bearded figure that you see um, when a peanut is cracked in half. So the next time you're at a baseball game, um, crack a peanut open and, and see if you can if you can find Moses uh, in there. And so these Yiddish terminologies um, for all of these botanical wonders were gathered and standardized in the 1920s for the Yiddish language school system in Poland, um, the aim of which was to, to use modern pedagogical tools to, to teach secular subjects in Yiddish, um, right? And there was also this belief that went along with it that fostering a connection to the natural world was particularly important for the, the well-rounded development of school-aged children. And so to this end, these new textbooks on various aspects of botany and gardening and agriculture were created to meet the curricular needs of students. Um, and as, as, as you can see here from these wonderful illustrations uh, from these books and from um, the, the children's uh, uh, school notebooks, um, they included everything from descriptions of the characteristics of flowers, trees, shrubs, and grasses, um, different diagrams on everything from the root system of various plants uh, to the reproductive parts of flowers, you know, explanations on topics like um, the germination rate of different seeds. Um, and, and some textbooks even give lessons on the varieties of, of fruits and vegetables you might find in, um, in a usual meal, including uh, more than a dozen types of kreut or cabbage um, that, that could be uh, uh, grown and, and, and cooked. Um, and what's interesting is that these um, books aren't limited just to those plants you find you may find in Eastern Europe. Um, there's a great illustration you see here on the page of um, of a cactus. And so these uh, these books, these manuals, really introduced um, and had terminology for for all of the plant world. The Yiddish school system also. Uh, created many materials for a variety of other subjects, including mathematics, um, the sciences, um, and, and again, YIVO has a hand in standardizing this, these types of technical languages um, that will be learned in school. So you see here um, some geometry notebooks from our collection, um, lists of things like chemistry terms, um, uh, astronomical uh, charts, um, and this, this great um, uh, image of a of an erupting volcano um, from uh, Julius Wagner's Tales from the Earth. Um, he uh, wrote Tales from the Tales from the Air, Tales from the Sea, all of these sort of short vignettes about uh, different natural wonders. So there is this real abundance of material in Yivo's collection that has to do with health and medicine. Um, much of it comes, you know, from these. Uh, ethnographic materials documenting folk culture. Um, and we see through these that uh, the traditional, for, that for the traditional Jewish population, um, health really was one of the most uh, significant factors in, in everyday life. Um, and this 
this idea is echoed in, in sort of everyday greetings. So you would say, Zai gazun, uh, be healthy, for gazun, uh, you know, go travel in, in good health um, when, you know, a, a, a person uh, is leaving you or when, when you are leaving. Um, and so the term health, gesund, um, was colloquially understood um, to be this sort of state of full vitality, right? Um, vigor, energy, um, longevity. Uh, and so the phrase a gesunter yid, a healthy Jew, um, didn't designate just a person who was free of illness, but a person who was very strong and, and, and very fit and, and exuberant. Um, and, you know, in the, in the, the eyes of, of the Jewish population, sort of the peasantry, um, those who worked in the sun, who were in the fresh air all day, um, sort of came closest to this idea of full vitality, um, right? There was this more, this positive image of the, the peasant's body, you know, in contrast to this kind of anti-physical image of of a scholar bent over the Talmud all day, you know, squinting, um, pale skin. Um, and so because of this, um, uh, Yiddish develops uh, uh, an expression kind of based on this idea. So gesund via poyer or gesund via goy, gesund via Ivan, um, as healthy as a peasant, a goy, a, a non-Jewish a non person, or as Ivan, sort of a stereotypical name for a Russian peasant. Um, and beyond that, we have materials that attest to sort of more scientific means of healthcare, um, as, as you can see on the, the, the screen here. Um, and many of these come from our collections um, from OZE, the, the acronym for the Society for the Protection of the Health uh, of the Jews, which is founded in 1920, uh, I'm sorry, in 1912 in St. Petersburg uh, for this purpose of um, improving the, the health problems of Jews in Russia and Eastern Europe. And so textbooks and posters and other educational materials um, were put out uh, both with the standard medical terminology um, as well as more colloquial terms for medical conditions and for, for body parts. Um, and so you see here the diagram um, of, of, the, uh, of the intestines. Um, and what's really interesting here is that it's labeled in three ways. Um, there's the English words, uh, then there are these words that are transliterated into Yiddish, um, and then there are the more widely uh, used Yiddish words for, for, those, um, for those organs. So stomach, uh, here is uh, mugen in, in, in Yiddish, um, esophagus, um, schlung uh, for the word to, to swallow, um, could also be called linkakel, which uh, would mean little windpipe. Um, the large intestine, um, maybe you, you've heard this word before, it would be the groisa kishkas, um, and the small intestine, um, the, the, the gedarim, the, the innards. So during the, the pre-war years, um, in addition to collecting all of these rich Yiddish short sources, um, YIVO was, was actively engaged in language planning and in language standardization. And um, as you can see from, from these examples that I've shown you uh, from our collections, Yiddish was used as a language for, for everything. But it never really had the prestige of other major European languages because it was never tied to the apparatus of a state or of a university. Um, and it was, it was often derided by both the outside world as well as by Jews themselves as a, as a, as a jargon, as a, as a jargon, um, or as a bastardized form of German, um, rather than ever being considered its, its own language. Um, and this was something, of course, that YIVO sought to change, um, you know, to elevate the language to one which had national prestige. Um, and so um, YIVO really was also invested um, in the idea of Jewish continuity in creating um, a linguistic-based national identity. And to do so um, meant that Yiddish needed to be taught in schools, it needed to be taught in universities, um, uh, it needed to be used um, in the service of, of creating all things literary and social and cultural. And so in many ways, the work that Yiva was doing in the 1920s and the 1930s was a continuation of what was started in 1908. Uh, there, there was a, um, an influential gathering in Chernovitz uh, of Yiddish writers and intellectuals 
who debated the status um, of Yiddish as a national language, uh, as a national language alongside Hebrew. Um, and there was, there was a call there for the creation of a standardized language with dictionaries and grammatical texts. Um, really, you know, they were seeking to, to elevate the language to the level of any other national European language. Um, and in addition, there was this idea that, um, that creating a cultural standardized language while also educating the masses of Yiddish speakers in this particular language uh, would, would serve to, to simultaneously raise the status of the language and also the cultural level of the people. Um, and so while there were a variety of um, Yiddish dialects, as I mentioned um, at the beginning of the talk, this literary standard eventually emerges and, and Yivo works with the school system and with Yiddish linguists um, to create a standard set of rules uh, for orthography. Um, you can see these here, they're, they're called the takonas, um, the rules of, of Yiddish spelling. Um, and, and these rules that, that Yivo codified um, became the, the, the standard uh, for those taught in the schools and universities. Um, and it is used today um, in most literary and cultural publications uh, throughout the world. Um, and so uh, if any of you are interested in, in learning Yiddish, um, YIVO still teaches Yiddish um, according to these rules. To this day, we run dozens of classes. Um, and so I encourage you to, to check out our website, to check out the Yiddish classes we have, uh, to check out the other um, programming and classes we have around Yiddish culture. Um, and of course, you know these, uh, these documents I showed you today are but a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of those that are um, available online. And so if you are interested in any of this, um, those materials are available to you. And um, YIVO's archivists are always on hand to answer any research questions that you may have to help you out um, with locating a source. So please um, uh, get in touch with us. Thank you. Stephanie, thank you so much. Um, and if anyone has questions for Stephanie Halpern, please put them in the Q&A box. I have a question, which is um, the people who have accessed this archive so far, I know because it's online, you don't always know what they're doing, but what's your sense of why they're accessing it? It's a great question um, and it is varied. So of course there, there are the scholars, you know, who are interested in Eastern European Jewish life, who, you know, work on folklore, who work on, on, on linguistics, um, who work on history, um, but there are also artists um, musicians. So part of this collection, which you didn't get to see today, um, we have a, a large um, collection of, um, of, of handwritten music manuscripts, hundreds and hundreds um, from the Yiddish theater, from, from Yiddish operettas. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, musicians come and use these. And in fact, the Folkspina, some of you may be familiar with, uh, with that Yiddish theater, um, they use this collection to uh, recreate the score and, um, and other materials from our collection to recreate the libretto of, of the Kishifmacher and the Witch, uh, which was a very famous um, uh, Yiddish play by uh, Abraham Goldfaden. And they, they put that on uh, not too long before the pandemic. Um, and then we also have uh, people who are interested in family history and genealogy. Um, we have a collection on Lithuanian Jewish communities, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, over 90% of the, the Jews of Lithuania were murdered during the Holocaust. Um, and so uh, this, this collection of materials um, gives insight into, um, into family history for, for people. Um, and and the, list, the list goes on. If any of you are interested in medical history, we have the records of, uh, of a doctor um, thousands of medical records that of his patients from the, the turn of the century um, that have never, you know, have, have really not been used before. So fascinating. What what surprised you the most when you started digging in? I know you've only scratched the tip of the iceberg. Uh, when I started digging into the collections. Mm -hmm. um, well, the sort of the sheer volume um, of yeah. it all, you know, and, and, and again, this is, you know, so much was destroyed. So this is um, a million and a half pages is, you know, is, is just a bit of, of what we had collected. Um, but I guess what, um, what is always surprising is sort of just how um, similar, uh, you know, Jewish life uh, is to, to, 
to the life we live today in many ways. Um, we have a great collection um, of youth autobiographies. Yvo ran many contests to encourage um, uh, youth to, to write in their experiences and, you know, uh, they offered a monetary prize. And so there is a great autobiography of a kid um, who talks about peer pressure and being being peer pressured into to, uh, to stealing and how guilty he felt. Um, there are great accounts of um, uh, these these youth writing, I, I held a girl's hand, I have a crush on a boy, please don't tell my parents, you know, um, and so sort of the, the, the things that, that we see today. And of course, as we've seen from all of these documents, you know, um, Eastern European Jewish life is very different than, than, what, we have, than what we have today in many ways as well. Um, uh, somebody asks, have you noticed differences in dialects across the Yiddish speaking world? And are there any examples that spring to mind? Um, there are, of course, many, you know, dialects. Um, and, and like I, I, I gave some of those examples earlier um, off the the top of my head, you know, I'm I'm not a linguist, um, so I'm not a, a, an expert in in the dialects. I I learned Yivo, uh, I learned Yiddish at Yivo, so I I learned Yivo standard uh, standardized Yiddish. Um, but we do have uh, linguists on staff, um, and so you know, please write to us, and we can um, we can direct you to to where you can uh, learn more about all of that. Uh, somebody asked, have Sephardic organizations also been able to collect and preserve their literature as well? And are there joint efforts to preserve the different languages? Um, that's a great question. So we are um, housed at the Center for Jewish History um, in, in the same building as, um, as four other partner institutions, the American Jewish Historical Society, uh, the, the Leo Beck Institute specializes in German Jewish history, the Yeshiva University Museum and the American Sephardi Federation. Um, and so they, they, they have collections, they're doing um, uh, great work um, to preserve that culture and those materials. Um, at YIVO, we actually have, you know, as you, uh, as I, I mentioned, maybe you, you don't necessarily see it from these materials because they are Yiddish focused, but we have materials in, um, you know, over a dozen languages um, from all over the world. And so we have a very large um, collection um, of materials in Ladino, um, both uh, in our archives and also in our library, which has 400,000 volumes of books. We didn't even get to that today. Yeah. Right, books, yeah. um, which leads to this question, how much of the collection is handwritten in cursive versus printed? Um, good question. Uh, in, in this particular collection, in the Vilna collections, right, our pre-war materials, um, I would say probably 60 to 70% is handwritten um, materials and, and the rest are, are printed. Very hard for me to, to give a sort of accurate estimate, yeah. Uh, like all archivists everywhere, you've probably gotten pretty good at deciphering handwriting. You have to, um, and we have, you know, we have people on hand who know all of those dozen languages. Um, so there's always someone who can help you out if you come to a document you can't read. Well, Stephanie Halpern, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us a sneak peek of this unbelievable treasure trove. And thank you all for being here tonight. I hope we will see you at another Planet Word program soon or in the museum if you get a chance to visit. Thank you all so much. <laughs>